Here we go, David Banner. Welcome back. What's happening? Yes, sir. Man, we had an epic one last time. <laughs> we did? We did. That last interview? <laughs> I mean, you saw what happened. Yeah, I'm poking with you. <laughs> Congrats, man. You know, we... Thank you. We're the OGs in this game right now, still going strong. I mean, that says a lot. Yeah, I, I, I have a tendency not to believe that. I don't like the word OG, because um, they only do that in rap. The, the Rolling Stones are about to die tomorrow, and they're just now considered OGs. People use the OG thing so you feel like it's time for you to retire. Like, that's, I ain't doing no reunion concerts. I ain't doing no throwback. You know, if you listen to the God Box, I shit, I'm fresher than any, I'm fresher than a newborn baby. You feel me? I, I don't play them type of pimp mind games. You feel what I'm saying? It's like, we're not OGs. We just, we just been able to, to dock numbers. And, you know, I even hate this as it pertains to, to, to anything that black people do in general. It's like, you know, a criticism that I have with basketball is that, you know, people want to give somebody OG or elite status you know, at the beginning of their career, you know, and, and what it does is it degrades the, the culture in general. It takes a lifetime to me, you know, to be an OG. It takes, you know, 50, 60 years. You feel what I'm saying? It's like, you know, rap is still relatively young itself. Rap is still not a, a whole person's lifetime yet. So quit with that OG shit. Like, I mean, people in general, like ain't none of us OGs. We, we babies in the game as it pertains to, to culture and something that I believe that will hopefully be here and stand the test of time. You know, I, I, I don't need no crutches. I don't need no extra names, just Young Banner, I guess, or Old Banner, or whatever the fuck you want to call me. Just call me fresh and don't call me broke. <laughs> I feel you, man. It's just that in this game of music and hip hop in particular, the lifespan is not that long for a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, three to five years, people come and go. So the fact that you see people yeah. like you, like me, that have been doing it for 10 plus years, 15, you know, I'm, I just counted the other day. I've been in the game 15 years full time. And uh, you just don't, you don't see that all the time. Yeah, it's, it's funny, man, especially as it pertains to Southerners. I tell people, you know, a, a lot of us, we were tired by the time we got on. You know, I, I watch some of the people I look up to, they were, were talking about um, um, retiring before they were 30. You know what I'm saying? I was like, dude, by the time I signed my first deal, um, well, not my first one, because that was penalty, but by the time I, I signed a deal that people know me for, the SRC deal, we had put together, you know, two full albums, well, three full albums and three, four, five mixtapes. You know, by the time we get to the starting line, we have, in a lot of cases, uh, 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 a, a catalog that can rival people who say that they're retiring. You know, I, 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 just, I just think that we have to, in some kind of way, change the culture. And I'm going to tell you something, Vlad, and I mean this. And I'm saying this to all artists in the world, no matter what color you are, no matter what you do. Don't allow um, these capitalists to make you feel like you have to compete with someone that you see on television or somebody that's popping online. Because in most cases, these children, are, we want to be them when you don't know what they've done or what they have sacrificed, or how many people they're signed to, or whether that's their spirit, whether that's their mind, whether that's their money. Um, if you are able to maintain your life, your livelihood, and take care of your monthly bills and your family, whether you're drawing, whether you're begging for money on the corner, whether you're rapping, you are winning. Don't allow someone else to define for you what success is. A lot of these rappers, when they're not able to, to match the sales of somebody else, you know, their spirits get broken and they believe that someone doesn't care about them. Man, uh, think about what our grandparents had to do. And I'm speaking about my grandparents in general. 
all the stuff that most of us do is shit that our grandparents would say were playing. You know, the fact that I can get in front of somebody and talk, the fact that you all can film somebody and make money off of it. Whether you getting paid $5 an hour, I tell my staff that one time. I remember uh, we were doing something for Gatorade and one of my staff members got mad because we had to do it 12 times. So we get paid fucking six figures. I don't give a fuck if we do this bitch a million times. The fucking money is there. You know what I'm saying? Like we're doing dream shit and complaining about it. You know, it's, it's for me, it's, it's amazing for me to, you know, the fact that someone wants to spend, you spent money for people to come and listen to me talk or feel me talking. I'm just fucking talking. That's it. That's a blessing. And if we don't start understanding, especially as it pertains to hip hop, the blessing that we have. I mean, when I was at my worst, I used to tell all my homeboys, don't come to my concerts fighting and shit. Don't come to my concerts with that bullshit. Like we have a fucking blessing. And I believe as a whole hip hop, we did not take care of this blessing. Think about this. Think about this internationally. And rappers try to separate themselves from other rappers. No, rap is rap. I don't care if it's hip hop, gangster rap, trap, whatever you call it. It's, it's, it's all one. Whether you want to call it rap or hip hop, it's fucking up to you. But think about this. I would say about seven years ago, hip hop really, really had power globally. Maybe let's say 10 years ago. And out of all of this power that we accumulated, what do you think we did with it? We sold somebody else's clothes and somebody else's alcohol and put our name on it. We had the opportunity to change the world globally. You know, and that's part of my responsibility. I'm not pointing at other rappers, I'm talking about me. You know, we had a real opportunity. I remember, I never told anybody this before. Um, I remember when, you know, Obama was, um, was when, when he first became president, and I was looking at, you know, the type of music that I was doing at such a, a point where I saw a shift. Whether I agree with Obama or not, there was a shift in black culture when he became president. And I looked at hip hop and I especially looked at myself and say like, where am I in the grand scheme of things? And think about this, Vlad. Think about this even with your show. Bro, regardless of what you do, regardless of what kind of music I make, bro, your ass is going to die. I'm going to die. This shit that we doing right now is going to be left on this earth. And I say, I, I don't give a fuck. I am not going to leave this, this earth. And in 300 years, the only thing somebody know about me is going to play with it or like a fucking pimp. We have a responsibility, not only to the fucking culture, but to our families and our fucking family names to go down in history with something that matters. And, and if you really think about it historically, when people are looked at, people are always gonna look at the art first. Whether it's the type of paintings they were doing at the time, the music, the writing, the scope of a generation or a scope of time is always judged by music. And that's one of the reasons why I think they push all of this negative music as it pertains to black people. So when white supremacy decides to do whatever it's going to do to our people, like I watched them pull out them tanks in, in Ferguson and they don't do that to any other group of people where the policemen pull out fucking tanks. I don't care if, 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 if you out in, in Vegas and they got sniper rifles, young white men got sniper rifles, the federal government didn't pull out fucking tanks. I believe it will be justified by the type of art that is out right now during this period. And I think that's important for us to think about, all of us who, who, who do something that's called art. And wait, and the other thing is all the people who have and make art and make money based off of the backs of black culture, we're gonna have to start calling these people and say, what are you doing to give back to black culture? People take, like I, 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 I watch all of these people, they wanna videotape black folks when stuff is popping, but as soon as we need cameras and eyes to protect us, 
the same people and these same sites, the same uh, 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 people who make money off of black culture never then turn around and use their cameras, use their pen. In most cases, there are exceptions to give back and protect the culture too. So I, I think that's important, Vlad. I agree. I mean, you know, because we get a fair amount of criticism for the type of stuff that we mm. do. But I don't think a lot of people see, for example, the interviews we do with like the Central Park Five to tell the story of the two kids who, who, you know, two of the Central Park Five who went to jail for nothing and how Trump started the media frenzy calling for the death penalty, you know, when they didn't do anything and they did, they did seven years or, you know. And then once they found out that they didn't do nothing for sure, they still didn't come back. And, and right the wrongs. Or, 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 and I say that about people all the time. Have you ever noticed when people talk bad about you and then they find out you're not the way that they thought you were, all they do is shut up? <laughs> they don't come back and give back what they took away. And that's, to, 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 to me, that's, to me in general, to me in general, that is white supremacy. When you don't have to do any other things or account for or say that anything matters or to say it's not that bad. Racism isn't that bad. The, the, the situation with police is not that bad. Oh, that's like me saying, hey ladies, pregnancy isn't that bad. How in the fuck would I know? You know, but I, I think what happens though, Vlad, is that w those of us who truly want to push culture forward, it is our responsibility to push harder. Like, I know me having the God box. People told me this is too space age for people right now. Nobody's going to react to that shit. This is college level work. Most people are doing music on the fourth grade level. Nobody, that was a lie. But that meant that I had to work harder, that I had to make stuff that nobody had ever made before, um, that I was going to have to spend more money, that I was going to have to sacrifice. And I believe as a black man, that is my responsibility. I don't expect kudos. It's like a lot of people think because they, I honestly believe I have one of the best albums in hip hop history. I will put the God box against any album that has ever came out that was under the genre of rap. And, um, but regardless of how it reacts, I don't, I don't deserve no fucking back, uh, pat on the back. I'm supposed to fucking be great. If, if you're putting out consumer products and you, 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 you say that you are professional, then you're supposed to be fucking great. But I just think sometimes as it pertains to the stuff that we do, Vlad, you know the state that America is in right now. You know what these kids are up against. You know that there are limited resources. So I believe those of us who say we OGs, it is our responsibility, if we are that, to teach and to push harder and to market harder. I give you an example. I am doing a secret project right now that I'm really not supposed to be talking about. Um, but I modeled this project after The Matrix. If you remember when The Matrix came out, wasn't nobody talking about the pill. Wasn't nobody talking about how fucking deep it was. People were talking about the new uh, martial arts that they were using, the new camera angles that's old as fuck now. You know what I'm saying? It was the excitement, but they knew what they had put into it. So I'm doing, I'm doing a project right now that has a whole bunch of information in it, but it's so violent, it's written so fucking well, it's so exciting, got so many explosions, that by the time people get over that, they be like, damn, I think David better trick me. I learned something. <laughs> And I think we all have to do that, Vlad, because one thing that I know about you and you know how long that I've been knowing you, you know what I'm saying? Um, bro, you know how to make money now. You, you are established now. There's nothing nobody can do about that, whether they like you or not. Um, it's the same with me. So since we know how to make money, like even with my movies, the movies and stuff that I put out, as long as I don't lose money, I don't give a fuck, because that is my responsibility. I have to give something back to the culture. And you know how when people tell, tell you in some religion that, that you're supposed to tithe? Tithe ain't, giving, tithe ain't giving to no damn church. 
You tithe by giving back to the people, directly giving back to the people. And if that means some of your fame, some of your brand, any of that, that's just what we got to do. So let's talk about the God Box. I've been, I've been bumping the album. First of all, why the name the God Box? Uh, I found out what God is. And um, when I found out what God really was, um, changed my whole entire life. I give you an example, Vlad. You see all, most of the things that have happened to me in the last two years. I barely audition anymore. Um, I barely ask people to do interviews. People come to me, ring my phone. I I found out what God was, and I stopped chasing men, and uh, I went in a, n another direction. And I, I think, you know, most people, especially in America, they're looking for God in every place but the right place. And um, I can't specifically say what the God box means because you never know how the most high or God or whatever you call he, she, or it is maybe working with you different. Erica Badu taught me that. She said when you explain stuff, then you take away people's personal connection. I've heard people give me an explanation for the God box that was 10 times deeper than what the fuck I meant. They were like, the God box me. And by the time they get finished, I'd be like, yeah, that's what the fuck I meant. You know, um, to me, even if you notice the uh, cover of the album, my name isn't on it. My name isn't on the cover of the album because I am trying to take me out of the equation. You know, I'm just happy to be a conduit between this form of art and, um, and the most high, hopefully. And I believe this album, same way Goody Mob did for me, same way Outkast did for me. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it souls of mischief. It gave me a place to travel. There's not much music. I'm not saying that there's not any music, but there's not much music that helps take you away from the everyday hustle and bustle of what the fuck we gotta go through. You know, so, you know, the God Box, the name of the God Box came when I figured out what God was. Okay, and what did you figure out what God was? Uh, don't you see I'm trying not to tell you that? <laughs> I don't want, I, honestly, Brad, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to tell people that because that's my personal journey. And I think that's part of the problem with America right now. You know, it, we just talked about that. Everybody has a fucking cell, uh, smartphone, but as a whole, Americans are fucking dumber. The things that we respect the most are the things that we have to fight for. The things that we have to sacrifice for, sacrifice for, ain't shit easy. Um, I can point people in a direction, but I read this book one time, and it's, it, it, I never thought about it this way. They said it was this young man who was being trained by the sensei. And, you know, he had been with him for about a month. The sensei barely said anything to him. He got angry and rose up at the sensei. And say, how dare I be here for a month and you not teach me anything? Since they said, come here. He took him out to the, the pond. He said, come into the water. Guy, I guess he thought he was going to be baptized. <laughs> no, sir. The sensei took, took his head and put his head under the water and held it until right before he was about to die. Then he released him. He said, until you want knowledge, like you want your last breath, you are not worthy. What I've gone through in order to understand the God box has been a lifelong, and it will be a lifelong, similar to that OG title. Everybody wants to be an elder without the struggle, without the gray hair. Everybody want to be Beijing. No, this is a title. And people have to find that for themselves. I think with this album, it will help nudge them in the right place. But think about it. If someone gave you everything for free, you would have no respect for it. So people are going to have to find God in the God box on their own. I feel you. I mean, one of the, one of the songs that kind of stood out to me was Marry Me. Really? Yeah. Wow, Vlad, I would have never thought that. <laughs> Marry Me. Oh, Vlad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I, I came from a two-parent home, 
My parents, yeah, my parents, my parents are still married, mm. and I feel in this culture today that the concept of family mm. is not celebrated in the same way that it was in previous generations. You know, you and I are a little bit older. You know, like a man that just takes care of his kids feels like he's doing more than he should, as opposed to a man that's married, lives in the same home as his children, and, and really raises his children. Um, because I don't care what the situation is, I don't care how strong of a woman you are, you are not going to be able to raise a child by yourself in the same way that you will raise a child with your husband. And especially a male child. Right, especially a male child. And I feel that the way that uh, welfare is set up is, is so fundamentally wrong because a woman will actually get more money when there is not a man in the house. Whereas if you flipped it around and said, if, if a male is in the house, you will actually get more money as a family unit, which will promote family. But it's not set up that way. So pe women are financially incentivized to not have a man around, which has very, very serious repercussions as a society. It, it does. Um, it's funny. A lot of the stuff that you're talking about, we had the conversation behind the scenes. And I was telling them, um, one of the things that they're fooling uh, America with now is everything is free. And it's really not. You know, everything is easier. Like, you know, everybody's doing some stuff fast. Everybody wants the phone to spell for them. You know, we don't want to run our own companies. We just want to let, you know, these conglomerates do it. And then we turn around and not know anything, not know how to write, know, not, not know how to add, not know how to cook for ourselves, not know how to hunt, not know how to protect ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Then we are under the control similar to women who are on that system, we are directly controlled by the system. This, um, this very good boxer, you should probably look him up, he's gonna be the future. Um, his name is Cloudy Boy, he's out of New York. He said something that really, 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 really touched me. He said, David Banner, when you give people the opportunity to feed you, you also provide them with the mechanism to control you. I was like, no, no. He said, if you give people the opportunity to feed you, you also provide them with the, mechan with the mechanism to starve you, is what he said. Mm. That's amazing. But, but what was it specifically about marrying me that, that you wanted me to comment on or say? Well, I mean, I think that not you know, just having the song about that is mm -hmm. something that, that most people just don't really comment on. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, 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 um, I made marry me, bro, because... Once I started looking back at my life and once I, I started um, sobering up and once um, I went to therapy and, and learned how to control my anger and um, deal with some issues that I, I didn't know that I had inside, I started seeing that there are some things that I could have definitely done better. Um, I'm past the point of regret because if I wouldn't have been the type of artist that I was, then me speaking about the opposite, I don't think these kids would trust me. You know, when I talk about black on black violence, well, people know I used to be violent. People know I had the guns. People know the stuff that I did. You know, uh, my misogyny, as not only as an artist, but just as a man, period. Um, I've done that. Even with me talking about our diet, People know that, you know, I haven't ate pork in 20 years now, but the shit tastes awesome. And, and I've ate, you know, just about every part of the pig. So when I speak about it, it comes from a place of, of, of information. It comes from a place of experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why when I make a song like that, it matters because, again, I'm not talking about any other rapper. I, I, I can only, um, I only know why I did stuff. You don't know other people experience. And I did that especially for the black woman. Um, our woman ha has caught the most, our woman, black women have caught 
most of the things that uh, uh, that have happened in America. They have had to be the cradle. They have had to watch their sons die. They have had to watch us, you know, go through the crack e epidemic. Um, they've had to put up with each one of these moments, and then they've also had to deal with the repercussions as it pertains to our men. So I, I said I wanted to be one of the grown men to stand up and say, you know, figuratively, if no one else cares, if no one else thinks that it matters, I think that marriage and you ma matter. You know what I mean? Now, when you talk about sobering up, I think you, you mentioned that at one point you drank so much Hennessy that your body started to reject alcohol. Yep, my liver started rejecting alcohol. Aha. Uh -huh, so and okay. I, I was drinking so much that the dentist asked me um, if I smoked cigarettes, and I told her no. And they were like, um, well, the back of your mouth is brown. I drunk so much Hennessy that the dyes, a lot of people don't know, most alcohol is clear, no matter whether it's what you think is brown or not. It's all clear. It's all alcohol, like <laughs> clear like rubbing alcohol, and then they dye it. So the dyes from Hennessy had, um, had stayed in the back of my mouth, and I was looking at Vibe, the year end of Vibe magazine, and they were like, you know, David Banner's Mr. Hennessy. And then I turned around and asked my friends, I said, do I drink that much? And then we went and looked at like, like a whole bunch of pictures of me performing. And in all those pictures, I had a bottle of Hennessy. And I was like, yeah, I got a problem. It used to be so bad that I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep without alcohol. And when I woke up in the morning, that was the first thing that I would do, just so my body could calm down. It didn't seem like I could go. <sighs> it felt like I was holding my breath until I took that first drink. Um, but what I will also say, in a lot of cases, some of us are depressed, some of us are angry, some of us are sad. We have all of these problems, but they're masked through alcohol, uh, sex, and drugs. Like, there were a lot of problems that I had that didn't come out until I stopped drinking. And I was like, well, why didn't I ever notice? I was like, because I was always fucking drunk. So I would drink my way through it, or I would fight my way through it, or I would kick my way through it, or shoot my way through it. And I, I want to say this to everybody that's, that's watching this. I'm not telling you not to do anything. You do whatever the fuck you want to do. But when you become drunk, high, or angry, that is an excuse to become carnal and not think anymore. You must stay engaged with your mind. I don't care if you beat somebody ass. I don't care if you jump off a building. Be intact with your mind when you decide to do it. What I found out is all those things for me were uh, excuses to not deal with the things that I was afraid of or the problems in my life. And we keep getting drunk and masking the problem instead of dealing with the problem, then it's gone forever. What we should do is attack the problem Make the problem go away, then celebrate. Because I, I think I heard Jay say this one time, like, you're supposed to drink to celebrate some shit. We drink just to maintain. You're supposed to drink when you didn't, you know, sold you a million copies or you got, you know, a million views on one, you know, one episode or whatever the situation is. It's supposed to be celebratory, not to maintain. Right, because, you know, and I've talked about this in other interviews, like one of my really close friends, um, he, he used to be a crip, and he had a very violent, you know, history. And we were hanging out at a strip club one night, and, you know, and I'm ordering drinks, and, and he's not drinking. And I'm like, you, why aren't you drinking? He said, I don't, I don't drink or smoke or get high. And I said, why? He goes, well, he, here's the thing. He said, when I, when I was in the streets, I started to notice that everyone I knew who got killed was high when that happened, every single time. And I realized that if I'm going to be out here and, you know. You got to be sharp. You, you, you have to have your mind together. And this is one of the smartest guys that I know. And so I said, huh, this is interesting. So I started interviewing a lot of rappers, and I brought this question up, a lot of Chicago rappers that come from an area of violence. And I said, how, how many of your friends were high when they got killed? All of them. 
they would say that every time, all of them, they'd be on lean, they'd be smoking weed, they, you know, they'd be drunk, whatever it is, they would be high, and then something bad would happen. And it, it really, it really kind of clicked in me. It's like people aren't being high to celebrate. People are just being high throughout their lives and putting themselves in risky situations and making bad decisions. Yep. And, and with me <clears throat> as a businessman, you know, a lot of artists, um, in a lot of cases, are sober when they get signed and then start getting drunk. But in some cases, they high before. But a lot of them are high and then they sober up and they're broke. You know, their lawyers are not high. You know, the record label execs aren't high. The distribution company, they not high. They want to keep you high and drunk. Go ahead and sign this, sign that. Like, I remember one time Universal sent me uh, a bottle of Moet and I fucked their head up. I'm like, I don't drink. I don't drink. Well, I'm not taking your alcohol. You're not going to know I'm drunk if that's the case. You know, the, the thing is, is that I don't understand this, like, especially as it pertains to artists, like, we, we high and we partying and we laughing and we doing all the work. Wow, the other part of our conversation, we doing all the fucking work and everybody else get, gets paid before we do. I just had a, a contract negotiation um, with a major label and fucked their head up because I, I do business through a banner vision. You'll probably never see David Banner sign anything ever because if I do business with a Banner Vision, I could dissolve a Banner Vision and David Banner is free. There's always going to be a buffer between me and anybody I do business with. But I told them, I said, why if this is a 50-50 deal, are you paying me like an artist? You get paid every month. I fucking want to get paid every month. And then I remember a lawyer saying, well, that's common practice. I said, motherfucker, slavery was common practice. That don't make the shit right. And then I turn around and ask the lawyer. I said, would you allow someone to do your son like that? And he was like, no, Mr. Banner, I wouldn't. Because what he was doing was, what he was doing was, when it was more convenient to charge me by the hour, he would. And when it was more convenient to charge me by percentage, he would. So... I had went out and get this, get, I had went in and, and landed this super big TV deal. It was unprecedented. And um, by myself, when everybody said that it couldn't be done or they couldn't get it for me, I went and got it myself. So he wanted a percentage. I was like, motherfucker, you didn't bring me this deal. And I said, you a lawyer, you do these kind of deals every day. I know you didn't spend more than two hours on this deal. Tell the truth. No, Mr. Banner. I'll pay you for 10. I'm not giving you 5% for fucking what? Why? Now, if you, went and, if you went and got the deal, I don't really give a fuck what percentage you get. Uh, I do, but I'm just saying, I'm speaking lightly. Um, because you, you brought me something that I wouldn't have had in the first place. So I get that. But because we don't study, because we're high, because we're drunk, even in my business day, bro, it's sort of hard for me to drink. One, because I work out. So... You know, by the time I work out, get to the gym, shit and shave, that's already a two hour process. It takes me about two hours to sober up, even if I get drunk. It's just like I just don't have the time in the day to drink anymore because I have to be sharp as a businessman. And I'm going to tell you one other thing that made me sober up a little bit more. I have a staff now. I have an office now. I have people. When it was just me, like if I would fuck up, then it didn't mean anything to me because I'd get out on the corner and sell CDs. People was tripping on the God box. I keep CDs everywhere I go. Just about everywhere I go, I make $100 just about every stop. I'm, they better you got that. Somebody bought a God box off me. And yeah, that's a, that's a ticket. And um, I just have to always be watchful. The other thing is I don't want another man to be in charge of my life. You know, even though I got security and I got all of those types of things, like all my security know, bro, like we watch each other. That's one thing they tell me. They like, Banner, man, if something happened, you got to get out. Fuck, fuck getting out. We all came together. And it's like it's it's you just have to be clear. You have to be watchful because the more successful you are, the more that people will prey on you, you know, and 
you, you, especially being from the South, and I believe it's the trees, it's like I can feel when shit. I don't know. My friends always said it was spooky. Anytime something was about to pop off in the club and I would leave, they would say it would nine times out of ten happen 10 to 20 minutes as soon as I walk out the club because I can feel it. And one thing people would tell you about me, historically, I never really would drink in a club anyway. Because as an artist, guess what the club is? It's my fucking office. I would always tell my friends, if you coming with me, you're going to fucking work. You know, I don't come to your job and sit around and kick it. So we have to be sober in life, period, just so we can accu accurately handle not just our lives, but our livelihoods. Before I launched Vlad TV, I did a documentary called Ghost Ride the Whip. And they gave me like, I don't know, 30,000 up front to do it. And it's, you know, when you do a documentary, it takes months out of your life. Like every day working on it, filming, editing, and so forth. Documentary came out, it was well received. It was on Netflix, it was on BET. And I never got a, a royalty check off it because they claimed they didn't recoup. And then I came out with another project and it was on Showtime. Once again, they didn't recoup. I never saw any royalty. And I said, okay, fuck all these upfront checks. I'm gonna launch my own platform and I'm gonna own my own content and it's not gonna make a lot of money at first. It's gonna make a few pennies a day, maybe a couple dollars a day and so forth, but the, it's gonna keep building up and so forth. And 10 years later, now I'm sitting on 10,000 pieces of content and all those pieces are making money and I don't have to get any upfront checks from anybody. Because recently we talked to Netflix and they told me what their deals were and you get a check and you get like a 10% fee on top of that but then Netflix will own your shit forever and own all the digital rights. And I'm like, well, what's the point of that? I don't, I don't see it. I don't need these types of upfront checks. I, I, just, I, just don't, I just don't need it. I'd rather take one one hundredth of that check and own it forever and be able to put it back out and be able to re-monetize it and so forth. But when I talk to movie people about it, they, they don't want to hear it. They're like, well, if I don't get this much money up front, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, well, you're not going to do it then. And, and it's funny, too, because when I speak, I'm, I'm usually always speaking from a black person's perspective. One of the other things is, too, you know, people ask me, well, David Banner, why isn't this happening more? Why isn't that happening more? I said, because I want to own everything. Like, um, people are surprised. Like, dude, I, whenever you see a billboard, I paid for it. Whenever you see a CD, I paid for it. But the difference is, what people also doesn't, don't, don't understand is people want all these astronomical numbers, but if you getting over 60, 70% of all the proceeds as it pertains to what you make, bro, if you can, if you can average 20, 30,000 people, Every time you do anything, whether it's a movie, whether it's a t-shirt, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, my hoodies go for, go for $75, right? Let's say right now, let's do the math. If, if 100, let's say, let's say 50,000 people, just 50,000 people bought my hoodie, right? $75. <laughs> Woo! That's a lot of fucking money. Right. That is a whole, and I'm gonna let y'all do the math because everybody wants stuff for free. Do the math on that, bro. See, the thing, Vlad, is I think because people are so vested in commercialism and we want what we see or what we think other people have, but a lot of those people need those numbers to even survive. Like, whereas people get pennies, like one or two pennies, you know, when you own your own content, you get, if not all of it, really close to it. So you're able to not only provide the vision, like as a black man, I want to change the way that people stereotype my people. But if I go to someone else and I try to break the mold, well, they're providing the money, then they control the content or how hard that content is being pushed. 
I give you an example. I'm pushing the God box for a year. I already have it budgeted. So how, whereas most labels push your stuff for two weeks and your whole life and your whole career is over, I'm pushing my shit as long as I fucking want to. And yes, like you said, it's harder in the beginning, but Vlad, tell these people, it don't take but one amazing thing to happen in your life. One of my friends um, shot a movie with Ice Cube and Cat Williams. He told me something, he said, Banner, all you need is one successful movie that you have uh, three to four credits on, whether you were the writer, uh, the producer, or you acted. All you need is three major credits that you're getting paid for, bro. That one movie can sustain you for the rest of your life. Yep. You know, if, if, if I wouldn't have invested back into rap, because one thing people don't understand, bro, I spent over six figures on me and Ninth Wonder Project. I spent over six figures on the God Box project. This wasn't somebody who, hype, who hypothetically talked about making music better. I invested in rap music in a time when people thought that that wasn't a good investment and what people would say is space age music. And people are going like, bro, these damn boxes right here, I can't keep these bitches in here, bro. It's like, if you give people, whether it's 10,000 or a million people, several options, like you give people several options and several things to come to your channel to look at, bro, and you continue to maintain that, bro, you can not only feed you, but you can change your whole community. Bro, I dealt with 20 black businesses on this God Box project and spent major money. You know, whether it's the design uh, of the CD, whether it's the artwork of, of the CD, most of the stuff, I'll say about 60% of everything that had to do with the God Box, you know, was furnished by a, a black business. I did all of the money and all of the transactions through a black bank. Like, it's not only about me as a businessman, because when I go and speak, Vlad, one of the things that hurts me the most, I ask the children, I'd be like, yo, how many of you all want to be millionaires? And everybody raised their hand, ooh, 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 me. And I asked most of them why, guess what they say? I want to take care of my family. I want to take care of my kids. You know, I want to take care of my girlfriend, my, my, my. Usually, there may be one or two that say, I want to do something for my community. I want to do something for other people. I want to provide jobs. One of the greatest things that I like about a banner vision and me, I cut checks. If you do a beat for me, I cut you a check. You ain't got to go to New York. You ain't got to go to L.A. You ain't got to go to none of these places. I'll cut you a check. Now, it may, <laughs> it may not be the check that you may be able to get from a conglomerate, but you ain't got to wait six, seven months. You know, I'm doing international business, and that's through having my own. One thing I, I wanted to show you, though, Vlad, that I'm, I'm very proud of, and I, I, I do want to open up the contents of the box, too. Something that people don't know about the God Box is that it's an art exhibit. Mm. Every, every, every uh, song has an artistic representation. And we're actually going to do... Um, the artist is uh, named Manziel Bowman. He's out of New York. Uh, he's Art X Man on uh, Instagram. We're going to do an art exhibit with the si with the headphones, with the silent listening parties, while people actually have an opportunity to look at the art. Like one of the things that I want to do with the God Box is I want to affect more than just music. Because one thing I noticed through doing this box, and I want to I want to open up the contents of the box. Um, Cause this is this is probably the greatest thing that I've ever done in my career, Vlad. Um, was this God Box box, and it's because I realized one of the reasons that people don't may not support conscious music is because they don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You feel what I'm saying? So what I did was Hidden Colors Three is in there. Black Friday. Black Friday is literally you know, about financing and, and, and financing your own business. And the thing that people are going the craziest about oh. is I created our generation, our own liberation flag. Um, T-shirts, 
you know, stickers, not just an album, um, two mixtapes, you know, the, uh, before the God Box mixtape. And the reason why this means so much to me is because this was the type of stuff that I wanted to do on a major label. You know, I had all of these um, amazing ideas. And on my wall in the background, it said, it's my fault even when it isn't. Like, dude, me and my staff, and it wasn't me all along. I got people all over the world helping me. We literally traveled and went to places so we can have quality. We can give our people quality products. Because in a lot of cases, because of systemic racism, people have tagged black people with being low quality. When most of the things that especially have to do with work, black people created it. But that's one of the reasons why the patent office was created, so they could take our shit and patent it. But I said I wanted to give a certain level, uh, uh, and Greg Street said this yesterday. He said, Banner, like, you did this shit. I ain't seen no shit like this in rap ever. And I think with me being able to do this, hopefully I can make people feel good about black businesses. Know that, that it's a level of quality, and especially, you know, in America, we've been getting fucked over by everybody's businesses. But it seems like, you know, just like murder and anything else negative, it's end up being compiled and dumped on black folks. So this God box has meant the most to me. And if y'all want it, you email bring David Banner to speak at gmail.com or go to davidbanner.com and get you a God box. Well, I mean, speaking of, of art, you you had said at one point that you had switched your style because you got tired of being America's N-word. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, one of the things that I think that happens that I don't even think that we as black people notice is that there's two types of, of black people that America loves to pay. And that's the out of control, stereotypical, you know, fear based black man. Then it's your total sellout, no beard no culture, he don't stand for nothing, just Mr. the get along guy, you feel me? And even though I've been conscious since I was in 11th grade, you know, there's a very, and, 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 and I promise you, man, when Dave Chappelle was going through what he was going through, bro, I wanted to just go find him and tell him, bro, I feel the same way. There's a, there's a very thin line between culture and stereotypes. You know, and I don't know if you remember this, doing my album Certified, I had started dressing up in suits. Right. And all my homeboys say, bro, what are you doing, man? Like, that's crazy. And I was like, bro, although we do wear gold teeth, although, you know, we do wear white tees, that's not the only thing in our culture. Think about our music. 80% of our music is about violence and selling dope, but 80% of our community don't sell dope, and 80% of our community is not violent. So then why is 80% of our music that? It's because that's what America pays for. That's what these record labels pay for. And black folks always get the residual effects of the shit that America has historically done, but we never put it on them white folks and them accountants and them lawyers that's sitting behind those desks. And I know one of them in particular who said he ain't signing nothing but violent music. So for me, you know, I had fallen into that myself. And if you notice, Vlad, I'm not talking about no other rapper. I am talking about me. I'm talking about the effect that I had. I am talking about, you know, waking up one day and looking at myself in the mirror. And although, yeah, I did a lot of stuff in the streets. Yeah, I got an anger problem. Yeah, I had guns. But I'm also a semester in the thesis away from my master's degree. I also threw one of the largest urban relief concerts in history uh, for Katrina. You know, all of the stuff that we do in the community. I am one of the youngest men who were ever inducted into the Mississippi Hall of Fame. Well, music. Next to B.B. King. You know, uh, uh, I had a 3.9987 in accelerated master's program. Nobody ever talked about that. But I, fall, I, I, I felt myself falling into um, those stereotypes myself. You know, and although I'm from that culture, although I've done more than the average person that raps about it, you know, I started looking at it like, damn, bro, I'm going overseas and there's not a balance of information 
that's being broadcast out about young black men and women. At the time when Get Like Me was out, that's when uh, reality shows had just started, you know, and then our rap videos. So, you know, when we're being attacked and policemen are killing us and all that kind of stuff, you know, America is trying to justify that through our what? Our art. Saying that the things that we're doing are justified, bro. And I just said, I'm tired of being that, man. I don't have to be that, bro. And, you know, I, I, I didn't get it when Andre made his chain, when Andre 3000 made his change, bro. I, I, I didn't get it. You know, I, 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 I said one thing that I did want to be, though, I think the person who did it, did it with that to me was 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 just so fucking genuine was Ice Cube. You know, when, when Ice Cube was, was made his switch and, and decided to go more conscious, he didn't change the way he dressed. He didn't, ch he didn't stop cursing. The information that came out of his mouth because he was feeding different types of information in, it came out and that's what I wanted to be. You know, it, it ain't, ain't too much different about me. I still want the same things. I still do the same things. Those things just don't control me. And Vlad, I'm going to be honest with you, man. The things that... I would have killed somebody over 10 years ago. They don't even matter anything to me now, bro. You know, and the sad thing is for the most part, a lot of a lot of people have bought into white supremacy, both black and white, because it pays. And then they use religion against you. You think because you're making money or it's easy on you that God has blessed you. That's a lie. If I've taken all the resources on this earth, and you start acting the way that I want you to act and I give you a little bit of your resources back and you think you think uh, uh, there's a connection between your prayers and you getting a couple of those resources back. That's some bullshit. I, I, I think that religion, you know, they talk about in, in America, especially in our major cities, how, you know, everything is is being co-opted and and re -gentrified. But the same thing happened in religion, the same thing happened in music, the same thing happened, you know, in, in, in the way that we look, you know, eh, it's a lot. I'll leave that right there. Well, you know, you mentioned Ice Cube. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you saw the video of Bill Maher calling himself a house N-word, you know, and then later on Ice Cube went and, and talked to him about that? Uh, I didn't get a chance to really watch Ice Cube's uh, video. I saw a little piece of it. Okay. Um, this is what I believe. But, but, but you saw the, uh, the Bill Maher one, the original one. Yes, I saw Bill Maher. So this is how I feel. I, uh, Ricky Smiley just called me, and uh, I did his show about it. Ricky is a really good friend of mine. And uh, I did a Facebook Live post. This is what I feel. Black people who are watching Vlad, for one time in recent history, let's agree on something. Let's agree that we're not giving any more white folks passes when it comes to the word nigga. See, there is, there's these gray areas and these people and some black folks feel like they can give certain people passes. None of us have the power or should think we have the power for a whole race of people. But let's just say today on DJ Vlad that we agree that there ain't no white folks calling black folks niggas in their face. And if you do, it's totally disrespectful and it warrants a fight. So what happens is, is again, our culture has been co-opted so much and so many of our leaders want to be up under white people with power that we give them passes. When the truth is this, I personally believe that Bill Maher is a little bit too comfortable. Because I, it, I, I said this and I mean this. I asked one of my white friends one time, I said, yo, bro, are you comfortable with saying the word? Uh, are you comfortable with saying, uh, are you comfortable with saying the word nigga? And he said, not around you. I said, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's safe for you. I said, but in general, are you comfortable? He said, yeah. I said, were you comfortable 10 years ago? He said, no. I said, why? He said, for two reasons, David Banner. He said, well, for one reason, I thought a black dude would kick me in my ass, so I was afraid. He said, that's one reason. 
He said the second reason is because I respected the struggle of what black people have gone through historically as it pertains to that word. Because one thing white people seem to forget, there is a reason why we don't want you to call us nigga and you are the reason why that shit happened. I am a victim of your fucking racism. So he said, well, David, I said, well, if you were not comfortable then and you're comfortable now, what does that mean? He said, damn, David, man, I never thought about that. He said, that means either I'm not scared of black people anymore or I don't respect them. If you love me, let's say something very bad happened to you, bro. Let's say you got stabbed with a knife in your fucking neck, right? When I'm around you, Vlad, I'm not going to be spinning a knife up in the air. Even if you play with knives, you want to know why? Because I respect what you have gone through. Black people had to accept the word nigga because we didn't have a choice at one time whether we were going to be called nigga or not. It was a whole five, over 500 fucking years of pain that white folks never did shit about. Think about this. Obama just passed the fucking law when he was president. He got not a law, but he gave twelve million dollars to 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 Jewish people who were affected by the Holocaust. I don't have a problem with that. That's cool. But America didn't have anything to do with the Holocaust. So if um, if, if white folks really cared about what happened to black folks, they would either give money or pass laws to protect them, which they have done neither for the most part. So for white people to want to say the word nigga and act like they care about us, get the fuck out of here, dude. Why would you want to do that? What, what is, what is the, the greed and the, and again, to me, that's white supremacy. You don't, it doesn't affect you, so you really don't give a fuck. Let me or you or any of y'all motherfuckers in here say something negative about a Jewish person. I bet you, I bet you DJ Vlad TV gonna disappear. I bet y'all David Banner CDs will end up being off the, they do something. Say something about any other race of pe people uh, on national TV that's derogatory. Lights and shit gonna start flickering off. But the problem is, is black people don't have anyone to protect them. Most other people have a country and a flag that will come to, 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 to protect them. Africa, for the most part, we don't have, you know, a country in Africa that's going to come to black people's uh, rescue at, for the most part. So it's like then we have to turn around to our oppressor, the same people who have done those things and called us and created that word nigga in the form that it is in now um, to protect us. You know, I want to ask, I, I, I always ask this in my speeches. If any of us, especially as a black person, if we do something to a Russian kid, guess who coming to see us? Russians. If we do something to an Asian person, guess who coming to see us? Fucking ninjas. Cut our fucking head off. When something happens in our community, we got to run to the police. And then the same motherfuckers in a lot of cases, that's killing us anyway. So the word nigga, bro, let's just say from now on, so it, it will be very clear. If you say the word nigga, it's a derogatory term. And, and, and I want to tell the youngsters this. This is to all of our, uh, our young people, because we always blame these children for their music and we always want to dump shit on these children. But our children, again, and I said this the last time, are a reflection of what we did not did or did not teach them. If y'all have white friends that are around you calling you a nigga, then that reflects on how they feel about you and they feel about your culture. The way that people act around you, I always used to tell people this, like, you, act, you say what you want to around the people that you feel comfortable around, around saying it around. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if Bill Maher was probably in the room with your friend that you told me about, do you think that he would say that? Probably not. Do you think if he was in Jackson, Mississippi or Brookhaven, Mississippi, where my uncle literally got hung, my great uncle got hung from a tree for fucking real. So you saying nigga means something to me. I'm not so far removed from my culture that I don't, rem I, 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 I don't remember or I don't respect it. The way that you let people talk to you and act around you is a reflection of how they feel about you. Your uncle got hung from a tree? Yeah. My great uncle. Great uncle. Uh, yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. I, I think that certain people... You know, like, like, for example, this has been a, an ongoing topic in a lot of my interviews with Lord Jamar. 
where he stated that white rappers you're coming to this almost as a guest okay matter of fact you are guests in the house of hip-hop just because you have a hit record doesn't give you the right <laughs> as I feel to voice your opinion and I, and I completely agree with him I actually there was an old interview I found years before me and Jamar started doing interviews where someone asked me that and I actually said the same thing just by total coincidence and I think that certain white kids feel because they have a certain number of black friends, they listen to hip hop, they might have messed around with a couple of black girls, that they now have a pass to say certain things, and they really don't. But, well, but th this, is what I, this is the thing that, uh, where my life has changed. I used to come from a place of, of anger. Now I come from a place of love. So I'm speaking from a place of love. If you have been blessed by hip hop and been blessed, black people have allowed you in their culture, you should love them enough to not want to say it. That is the point. Even if they let you, it, it, it doesn't fucking matter. But the fact that we allow them to be comfortable enough. You know, I, I remember when I, I got into a conflict with somebody about it. You know, um, the fact, that's what I was telling you about white supremacy. The fact that white people feel comfortable enough to argue with the black person about how the shit that they did to us makes us feel it's white supremacy. Because at the end of the day, if it hurts me, you can go on back and be white. I still have to deal with that. You, you understand what I'm saying? So my point with those rappers is not just the face, not just the fact that they should be punched in their fucking mouth, but from a love perspective, if they really love and respect the culture, then why would they want to do that? And, and let me ask you another question. And, and this is when you were asking me the question about, you know, people, uh, uh, the rappers who were half white and half black. I would always notice with the exception of maybe one or two that I've heard, they go real hard on the word nigga, but you never hear them say cracker. You never hear them say anything derogatory about the other side of their family. So the people who buy them and the culture that they are in, you, would, you, should, you should hold them up and call them gods. But because something has happened to them historically, and maybe they may not in some cases even know that there is a problem, you talk about them the worst. Why didn't you do the co why didn't you do the, the culture or do something from the culture of your other side that you hold so high? Because if that's the case, then why don't you talk about everybody equally? The same people or those same rappers who want to say nigga, are they as excited to say anything else on their record? But most people are scared, even other white people, of what white society will do to them. Because all they do is pull resources. Like I told you last time, white supremacy is only afraid of two things. That's the loss of life and that's the loss of finances. But the flip part of that is when you own the power to take a life or take resources, then you, in, in most cases you also uh, control the mind and the mouth of those who come up under you. One of the things that that Ice Cube told Bill Maher was that the N-word was used by white people as a weapon and, and they can't have that word back now. But if you take a step back, do you feel that that word should just be removed altogether? Because you don't hear other races using derogatory terms towards each other. First of all, other races, excuse me for interrupting, haven't been through what black people have been through as long as we went through it. And in a lot of cases, a lot of other races who have went through some similar things, they can move and matriculate within that oppressive race in some cases without being detected if they would throw away their culture. The, the, the problem with black people, and I, I, I keep trying to explain this to folks, is that we haven't been out of slavery 
longer than we were in slavery, and people keep forgetting mm -hmm. that. And we've never been reprogrammed. Even the so-called smart black people who went and got conscious, most of them didn't come back and teach. So we never got any mental therapy, social therapy, uh, cultural therapy. Like, I don't, I, I, I did my blood test, I found out what region I'm from, but I, culturally, I don't even know where the, fucking, where the fuck to start. So we, most of us who are conscious, and that's on the internet and that have smartphones, we judge everybody based on what we know. When in most cases, that was the reason why I made this God box box. Is I know most people don't understand what the fuck I'm talking about on the God box. So we have to educate them. We have to surround them with the DVDs, with the lectures, with every fucking thing that you possibly can. That's the reason why I, with the exception of LA, um, and Chicago and Houston, only because they paid me to come, I go to small towns where people don't go to. I go to the places where the rappers are scared to come. You feel me? Or most entertainers are scared to come. Where most of their grandparents are from. Where, where, where they're not privy to that type of in information. Whereas what they don't understand is growing up, if you research the black codes, they, I, I talked about the school system. You criticize young black kids for not wanting to read and do math. But a, a shit, a few decades ago, there were laws like yeah, a few, 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 few decades ago. Um, there were laws that if you knew how to read or write and you were black, you could die or fucking be locked up. Nothing ever happened to subsidize that gap. So it's like even with my flag in my box. People have to know why it is important to have a flag. If they don't, it's just a piece of cloth. I don't want people to stop saying nigga because somebody forced them to say nigga. I want people to stop saying niggas because they are gods and because they know that they are gods. But there are some niggas out here and it ain't all black people. Ignorance and, 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 and lack of life and information, it, it can be Anybody, white folks can be niggas, anybody can be a nigga. The problem is the, the, the use of it to blanket a whole race of people. So for, 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 for me, I, I, I just think that, I, and I hate so much when people point at someone else and say, because you do something, it makes my wrong right. My wrong don't make your wrong right especially why you the reason why it's wrong in the fucking first place. Um, and I also have a problem culturally is when white folks go to Africa, or white folks come to the hood and they have opinions on, on, on how to make black culture better. No, come and fucking listen. Come and ask, how can you help? The problem of thinking that you're smarter and you're better and you have the answer for something that you are not is the problem in the first place. See, and, and what you can do is for, um, they'll give money for dogs, they'll pass law for dogs, even doing the point where, uh, where, 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 where innocent black children were being um, murdered at a very high rate by cops. Innocent people, they pass laws to protect cops during the time when they was out here killing black motherfuckers. It's the same thing with, with, with the owner of the fucking Clippers. He called us a nigga and he got a billion dollars. Don Imus called our women nappy head hoes and got a million dollar deal. It's like when white folks do wrong publicly, they get paid for it. We, we, just, we just go away and deal with it pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. I interviewed Brother Polite. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. Um, you know, uh, a conscious figure out here in LA. And one of the things that he brought up that we discussed was... It's a black man or black woman who's doing relatively good. They have their own car, they have a nice house, they have nice clothes. They manage to do good by themselves and for themselves. And matter of fact, they even doing good for their family. How might he be able to, or how might she be able to do these things void of master? See, this is a person who hasn't gotten out much. So all they know is we get food, clothing, and shelter from master. So they will have to surmise that the only way 
the free black man or free black woman got their food, clothed in the shelter must be from the same construct. And this is the conflict that at, that's at hand today because people have to believe there has to be a catch. There has to be some brown nosing. There has to be some kind of compromise in order for somebody to succeed they had to do something wrong mm. to get it. And I understand, because being in extreme poverty, living in destitute areas, going to schools that's dilapidated, it incurs so much stress that it makes you give up. Before we say historically, understand that we only talk about a small chunk in history. Uh, in America, in America. Were, Black people, okay, black people were ancient and had way more money than any right. white person has ever existed. So I just need us to be careful with saying historically Sorry. because historically that's a flawed statement. Absolutely, you're absolutely, but in, absolutely, in, absolutely right. In, but in recent America. In America, okay. in America period, that that had to happen in order for a black person to become rich. There was a white person that cut that check. So when they see someone who appears to be self-made, they can't accept that. Be so therefore, they create this conspiracy theory because they can't come to grips themselves that this person actually got there by hard work and their own intelligence. Um, I, I, I think that that is, is flawed, and um, I don't think that that's the case. In a lot of cases, it's just the things that matter to us on television. You know, we look at it from, from that perspective, but there's so many businesses and so many people that built themselves up from from nothing, you know. Um, I even look at most of us as uh, Southern artists and people who are from the Bay, you know. Um, or sh anybody for that for that matter who was in music, they didn't like our music in the first place. Most of us were, if not millionaires, very wealthy. Slim Thug, perfect example of that, was. Well, 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 was possibly a millionaire way before. A lot of us were way successful and, and literally like we were talking about today, we talked about a lot of positive stuff before the interview. Um, like, dude, we were running healthy businesses and we thought getting a deal was the way to go. But most of us who came from places that were not historically hot, we had to build our own businesses and our own uh, 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 situations regardless anyway because they weren't signing us regardless. The only time they started really signing Southern groups when they saw that we were gonna, I mean, basically build empires without them. A lot of cases they give us money not because they wanna sign us or they want us to uh, be successful. They sign us in a lot of cases to get us the fuck out of the way. Because if we would have really realized I think all of us that were independent, probably if we would have kept going in about four years, we would have been something that possibly could could have, I, I can't imagine, bro, knowing what I know now, but that's just, that's just flawed. And a lot of that has to do with the way that we view ourselves. That's the same thing that I was telling you, just about low quality. You know, a lot of people look at themselves through the eyes of white supremacists and they don't know it. You know, anytime you see a black man, there has to be something negative about it. Or, you know, you'll pay, you know, $4,000 for a pair of uh, uh, Gucci, whatever, but get mad because a black man wants you to buy his shoes for $500. Even if it is bad, why do we have to say something? Like, that's one of my criticisms about most hip hop blogs most hip hop, anything that says hip hop. I said, this is one of the first interviews I did with you recently. I was like, everything that says hip hop for the most part doesn't do anything but degrade hip hoppers. Tell all of their business, it's all negative, 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 negative. And that's the case with most things with black folks. But what I, what I do need us to do is stop concentrating on those two or three comments. Like I notice myself, I even do that. There will be a million people that say, David Banner, you dope. David Banner, glad to have you back. And one motherfucker be like, oh, man, the snare wasn't right on track seven. And that's all I think about all oh, fucking, that motherfucking snare on track seven was dope. You know, I, I don't even, 
I don't even, and a lot of them people be trolls anyway, bro. It's like, they were talking, I, I read this uh, magazine where they was like, uh, a lot of white supremacists were, get, were getting black, putting black faces on Twitter and just keeping a, a, up a whole bunch of drama. You know, and then some people are just haters, but a lot of those people don't even know why they hate themselves. So we have to stop really paying attention to them, bro. I really, they don't really matter to me in the greatest scheme of things. I agree. Now, you said, I think it was on the Breakfast Club interview, you said that why did Martin Luther King and Malcolm X hurt the movement more than help? Uh, what, I, what I said was, this is what I said, is we have a tendency to follow people instead of what's right instead of the cause, instead of the movement. Um, I'm gonna ask you this question and just answer it for me. When Malcolm and Martin died, for the most part, what happened to the momentum of the movement? Slowed down. It stopped. Stopped. For the most part. It didn't slow down, it stopped. Hmm. And for the most part. And no one person is greater than the movement or the cause. So in, 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 in that way, that's what I mean, is that we put too much pressure on the people. You know, people tell me that all the time, David Banner, we think you should be a leader. And I say, well, look at what y'all done to our leaders. People kill Malcolm, Martin, Pop, everybody else that we love. And we don't do shit as a whole. Whether white, black, or indifferent, we allow America to ridicule and slaughter and emasculate especially black leaders. And nobody does anything. Everybody just sits back like there's a roach in the room. So when I said that, what I meant was this, is to have a group of people who matter that much to the movement, wouldn't the smart thing to do would be to cut off the head? And when you cut off the head, what happens? The body falls. So as it pertains to the movement as a whole, their existence as it, as it pertains to, to the movement was more of a detriment. Because at least before them, the movement was moving, right or wrong. And it was moving at a pretty cool pace. But when they killed our leaders, and Malcolm X changed my whole entire life, bro. I pissed somebody off one time. They asked me if there was anybody in history that I would want to meet, who would it be? Anybody. And I said, Malcolm. And well, what about the religious? I don't know if they really existed or not. <laughs> I know Malcolm existed. That's who I would want to speak to. And um, I'll just say that, um, you know, if we look at where we are right now, um, the death of those two men are, are those two men are partially why we are where we are. Yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from. I mean, because since then, there hasn't been a prominent black leader. I guess maybe Tupac would probably be the next one in line after that, and then that's pretty much it. Well, what I'll tell you is this: um, I think there has been leaders. Um, but I said this in one of my songs on the God Box, bro. Oh, and by the way, I have a tendency not to do this. Go and purchase the God Box. Don't stream my shit, buy my shit. I don't want fractions of pennies. I didn't spend fractions of pennies. I need you to go purchase it. Um, it was so amazing. The first week the album came out, we were number one on iTunes. So I thank everybody for the support. But I look at I look at how much people marvel at us and love us, go and support. Y'all have already done a great job, keep going. I had to say that. But there are people who ha have the potential and have led on that level. Um, but what I will say, the thing that we have to understand is that I, I said it on A My. Like, why would these kids want to be leaders? When I go to elementary schools, elementary schools, and I ask kids, historically, when you're a black man and you stand up, what happens to you? These are little children. Guess what they say? You die. You don't think these kids know that shit? Stand up and be black 
and, and successful at the same time. I had a, a history teacher at the University of Maryland. This man showed me something so dope. He listed, I think it was 12 or 14 characteristics of the slave master. It was, you know, uh, handsome, well-spoken, just all of these different qualities. He said, if you're a black man and you have any three of these qualities and you're a public figure, something's going to happen to you. You might not die, but something's going to happen to you. And he used Tupac. He said, handsome, well-smoking, smart, dead. And so these children know that. And I, and I said that on A Ma, why would you want to be a king when you see what happens to kings? You know what I'm saying? So, like, if, 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 if we really want to truly see a, 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 a leader or a movement, we have, we, have, we have to support. But I think one of the things that we won't admit is that most of us, although we may hate white supremacy or we may hate racism, um, there are a lot of people that benefit off of it. You know, and benefit off of America being exactly the way that it is. That's why I tell people, I don't think our leader is going to come in a lot of cases from, uh, from somebody who's famous or rich. Because they made their money with it being exactly the way it is right now. You had a conversation with Jim Brown after he met with Trump. No, I didn't have a conversation with Jim Brown. I had um, um, one of his really, really close friends is a very close friend of mine, um, Bobby. And um, he's become a friend. Um, and I, I met him when I went on uh, Brother Zoe's show out in, in LA and we, we still talk on the phone to this day. And uh, I, I called him after I saw what happened and he said I was one of the few people that called and that they can't really respect it that I called before I gave my opinion. Okay. Well, you've talked about Trump and you said Trump is the, the best thing that's ever happened to America. One of the best things. And, that and I said one of the I said one of the best things that happened to what what I said was one of the best things that has happened to black people in recent time. And why is that? Um, when the last time you've seen our people disengaged for this long in the political process? I mean, you're right because when Obama was president, I mean, as, as a as a hip hop site with a primarily African American audience. We did not cover politics as much during the last eight years when Obama was president. Now we cover politics all the time and it always engages. Right. So let me tell you, the, the, biggest, the biggest blessings and the biggest lessons are learned through strife and through hard times. You know, one of the greatest things that I think Trump has done is taking the liberal white Americans uh, term of post-racial away um, and really shown what America is. Like, think about all the racial shit that's happening, especially on these um, predominantly white campuses. You see all this racist, yucky, ill shit that's happening, and we act like these motherfuckers was born soon as Trump became president. The motherfuckers been doing that shit. They have been wanting to say the shit that they say. They have been, like, Folks have been waiting, and that's especially, especially white women. You know, you, you, most of us would have thought that white women were probably the most liberal, you know, the people who possibly supported black people the most. The polls say uh, different, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I just want truth. I tell people all the time, I think that white, white people in Mississippi are the best white people I ever met in my life. And people say, why do you say that? I say, uh, if they love you, they'll die for you. If they hate you, they'll try to kill you. Like, white folks and black folks in Mississippi don't, they don't hang around each other like in these other cities just to get along. If you see white folks in a black neighborhood, you know they down. If you see black folks in a white neighborhood, nine times out of ten, you know they accept it there. It ain't, it, there's no misconception of where you stand. Mm. 
And as people, that's all we should want, especially all these religious people. You always talk about truth and God. God is the truth. God is science and mathematics. It's exact every time. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what Trump is bringing. I mean, and he even said it. Have you ever seen that video back? I think it was about almost 20 years ago. It was it's on YouTube. He was like, man, if I would have ever run for president, he was a Democrat at the time. Right. He would say, I would run as a Republican and use, um, for the most part, I'm paraphrasing right here, and use middle America's racism against them. And he did it. Right, because. He said it and he fucking did it. Right, and he said that so because, the uh, the because day, Republicans are the stupidest party. <laughs> so I think both parties are stupid. If, if, if you say that you're a Republican and Democrat before you hear the facts, you're a fucking idiot. Chris Rock said it. I am a thinking man. Give me a proposal. And if it works for my community and my people, I don't give a fuck if you're alien. It doesn't matter to me. I'm a thinking man. To jump on, I am on the side of right. If you are right, then I am with you. So for me to say I'm a Republican and Democrat and I don't know what the fuck y'all own this year, Democrats don't give a fuck about black people. Republicans don't give a fuck about black people. So I think black people should pull out of both and have both of them to come and, you know, give what they're going to do for the community. Democrats historically think they have black people, so they don't do nothing for them. Republicans know that black people, for the most part, going to go with the Democrats, so they don't try to do anything. So we left with both sides. I said it on the God box. Whether it's right wing or left wing, it's part of the same fucking bird. You said that black people aren't racist enough. Yep. What does that mean? When I said that black people are not racist enough, what I meant is that by nature, God, he, she, or it, made us what we are for a reason. Um, ants take care of ants, lions take care of lions, tigers take care of tigers. Historically, white people are supposed to take care of themselves first. What a lot of people don't understand, it's, it's a fight and it's about genetic annihilation. Black people are at war and don't even know it. You know, we, we think shit is fair. We think it's religious and everything gonna be all right in the end. It's fucking not. If we don't do for our people, if we don't create for our people, it will never happen. Because white people are supposed to put their people in their movies first. It's their shit. So what we should do is make our own shit. The only problem is if we do become more racist, like I think we should be, then all they're going to do is come and burn down our fucking communities or sick the feds on us or Cointel Pro like they historically have, which means we must protect ourselves too. You know, nothing is wrong with racism. The, the problem in America is, is our lack of racism. We spend a well over a trillion dollars a year. Imagine if we spent it in our own communities. I say this all the time, I wouldn't need them if I need you. You know, um, a kid at Central, um, Central North, North Carolina Central taught me this. Shout out to Ninth and Laval Moton. Um, he said racism, he said race is the root word, ism and ist is the act of. So you are supposed to take care of your race. But the problem is, again, because of chattel slavery, because of what black people have, uh, been go have gone through, our God, our history, our culture has totally been erased. So even if we were to be racist, a lot of us wouldn't know what to be racist for or to. Think about this. This is the most racist shit I've ever seen in America, period. You know, they say that some kids can't come to school with locks. Mm. And locks are your natural hair. That they can't come with braids or twists. So basically what you're telling them is that if you don't make me comfortable and if you don't look as close as you possibly can to white, then you need to get the fuck out. So what that tells me is that we need our own schools. You know, we need to feed. We see what they do to our water. We see what they do to our kids. They see what we, they do to anything that comes to our communities. We got to take care of us. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's actually positive.
Because people are going to do for you what you do for yourself. If you don't take care of you, then why the fuck should someone else? Yeah. My, my humble opinion. Yep. The God box of stores now. Go purchase it. I, I do want to say something before we close, man. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would just like to thank um, hip hop in general, like rap music in general, gangster rap, whatever y'all call it. Um, you know, I've been able to navigate myself through hip hop professionally now for close to 15 years. Um, I've been part of, you know, I had forgot that I had produced, I had produced so much music. I mean, I range from Quincy Jones to Maroon 5 to Wayne. There's a lot of stuff that I've done, man. I, I even sat back and looked at the fact that there's a lot of people that I've done records with that are dead, bro. Like real live dead. I set up, man, it was like Static, Nate Dogg, Mr. Magic. Bro, it goes on and on and on. And, you know, to put out the God Box and to have, you know, the number one album on one of the biggest platforms on this planet with no single, no new video. And for me to be selling stuff and can't, I can't barely keep T-shirts and flags and boxes in. You know, uh, I turn down interviews, bro. And... I'm grateful and, and, I'm, and I'm humbled that people have allowed me to change. Not only am I still around, but people have let me evolve. You know, I walk through the hood, man, and they like, man, I, man, I, I appreciate you, man, for that black power shit you on. And I'm grateful, man. I fly and the, um, the young ladies who serve the drinks on the plane, they be like, here, Mr. Banner, stick it to the man. Here goes some free Hennessy. And I'm like, I'm in first class, I get it for free anyway. Well, here, take some more, fight the power, brother. And, 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 I, and I do want to say that I'm thankful and I'm, I'm grateful. Man, I have, you know, three very successful businesses outside of uh, hip hop. And one of them, I make more than I make in hip hop. One of them, I probably make more than a lot of companies in hip hop make. And it allows me to to push culture forward. You know, even some people who work at these major conglomerate, like, you know, all of the major conglomerates played Black Fist. And that was a heavy ass video. <laughs> I didn't think they was gonna play that shit. I ain't gonna even lie to you. But they played that shit and they played it a lot. I was actually like, wow. Like a lot of shit I send to these folks, I don't really, <laughs> I really don't believe that they gonna play it. I hope that they do. But I want to tell you this last thing, Vlad, that happened to me. I, I had a very big meeting in, um, in L.A. with a Fortune 500 company. And uh, we are in negotiations to them picking up all the marketing for the God Box. Um, and um, they asked me why was I interested in doing business with them. And I told them, because you have the eyes of my children, good or bad, I can talk this black power shit, I can talk this black power this, uh, the community uprising, but if I don't have the eyes and the interests of our children, it doesn't matter what I'm talking about. No matter how jamming it is, I know for a fact that I have one of the best hip hop albums ever. I don't give a fuck what nobody else say. I know this. But if kids don't see it as being successful, Think about most of our, our, our heroes as, as it pertains to those who are freedom fighters. They drunk, I mean not drunk, but they broke and lonely and fucked up. Kids want to be successful. They want to be popping. They want shiny shit. That's why I make my God Box shirt shiny. Kids come from opulence. That's in their DNA. So I told them, I said, I'm, I, I want, I want, an opportunity for our children to see someone who stands for their people, who articulates the pain of our people correctly, and who's still doing well. The same way you said about the Illuminati. You know, anybody who's successful, they find a reason why there's something wrong with it. No, let's let people know that it's all right for you to have pride and, and, and to be black. That don't mean that you got to suffer and be broke and lonely. I want shit. 
And I'm gonna tell you this, bro, I don't give a fuck what happens in my life. My children are not gonna suffer for what I believe in. I will fight and continue to fight for my people, but my wife, whoever she is when I get her, and them kids, I'm gonna pop off in her, cause when I find her, I'm gonna, I gotta go to work quick. <laughs> I gotta wah, 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 wah. Oh, y'all might fly over an island, a deserted island one day, and y'all look up, y'all look down, and y'all see some kids going, damn, damn. Y'all say, oh, David Banner finally landed. But um, I, I, I just, I, I'm not gonna let them suffer for what I believe in. So I appreciate y'all for allowing me to change and, you know, giving me a platform to speak not only for me, but for my folks. Yeah, man. Definitely appreciate the time, man. And you and I go back around 10 years, you know, to the SRC days, everything else like that, man. Great to see you doing well. Best of luck to everything you do. It's, it's good to be here, man. And, um, yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. I want you to watch this so you can say that I told you. Okay. A lot of people, you know, they marvel at my career and say how great of a career that I had. My shit just started. Mm. Like they, you know, they want to call me OG so I can retire and get, mm -mm. I'm on their motherfucking ass. You hear that God box? Did you hear that Magnolia? That boy rapping like he two years old. Mm. And, and, and I read a lot and I'm smart and I've been through some shit. Yep. I love y'all the God box.